Here at First Roanoke, the mission matters most. Our mission is to see people connected in Christ to lead others to Him. How do we accomplish this? By loving God, growing together, serving others, and changing the world. Let's launch into this new season of ministry together. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. We looked at chapter 1 last week. We've got a four-part series for four chapters as we fly fast over the book of Philippians. We did chapter 1 last week. If you were not here, I encourage you to go online and watch that uh, message, that study will catch you up to where we are today. I want to begin reading in verse 12, verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumblings or disputings that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And may God bless the preaching and teaching of His Word to our hearts and to His church on this Lord's Day. When the space shuttles were being launched, uh, there came a point after every liftoff when you would hear Mission Control tell the astronauts, you've reached negative return. According to NASA's official website, negative return occurs when the space shuttle is flying too far downrange and too high to return to the launch site in the event of an engine failure. A negative return also means that for the astronauts, they are now to the point where they are assured of making it into orbit, which is the whole reason why they launched in the first place. Tommy Henson drew the following comparison uh, for the child of God in the Christian life with this idea of negative return. He writes, Jesus is saying, only by crossing the point of negative return, letting go of the option to turn back, can you actually do what you were meant to do. Whatever your landing site was, your identity, your sense of purpose before you came to me, you need to leave all possibility of returning behind. This is Jesus' invitation for every follower of His. You see, following our Lord Jesus as His church means that we're willing and ready to cross the point of negative return and let go of our preferences, our conveniences, and even our comforts, not turning back for the sake of launching out together as shining lights to the world. That's what Paul wanted for the church at Philippi. That is what God wants for His church here at First Roanoke. No matter how convenient now uh, or comfortable we might find our present schedule to be, ultimately as a church family, we want more people, not less, to receive Christ. More people to become part of His church right here at First Roanoke. We want more people to become followers of Christ and His disciples to discover the joy of worshiping the Lord, studying His Word, seeking Him in prayer, serving Him together, going on mission locally and globally to tell others about Christ. I believe this is what Paul wanted for the church at Philippi, and I believe this is exactly what the Lord wants for His church and for each of us. And, and that is what the new schedule is about. After all, if we're going to have a time for a worship service, shouldn't we have a time when most people are most likely to attend those worship services? And that's why our celebration service on June 5th will move uh, ahead to or back by to 9 o'clock, by 30 minutes. It's a change. It goes from 8.30 to 9.00. Uh, our Bible study, Connect Group Hour, goes from 9.45 to 9.15 for the first hour. And then our Genesis service, this service, goes back from 11 o'clock to 10.30, as well as the beginning for our second hour of Connect Groups. 
Uh, basically, if you drive downtown, you come to church in the morning and you leave in the morning if that's what you need to do. You see, we want to be sure that as lights in the world, we make it easy, not difficult, for people to become a part and experience our worship together on Sunday mornings. Uh, three things I want us to see in our verses this morning, talking about being lights in the world and to the world. First of all, put your faith to work. If we're, a Christ, if we're Christians, let us put our faith to work. Uh, notice what Paul says, therefore, and he begins therefore. So, what does that word mean? It means we should look back to see what it's there for. Going to verse 1 of chapter 2, the Bible says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And so with this in mind, Paul writes in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, because of what I've already said, because of what you've already done, because of what you've already learned, because of what God has already done in your life, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What an interesting phrase. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Make no mistake that launch day Sunday for us will be nothing more and nothing less than the opportunity for us to work out our own salvation, to put our faith to work as a fellowship, as a church family. What exactly does that mean, work out your own salvation? You're probably thinking, Brian, I thought salvation was a gift. I thought it was a result of, of unmerited favor from God. I thought it was by grace. What, what does God mean when He says, work out your own salvation? Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 6, verse 44, no man comes to me except that the Father who sent me draws him? Doesn't the Bible say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved? Didn't Paul also say in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Those Bible verses certainly don't convey the idea that, that we can somehow work out our own salvation. What does that mean? Well, first of all, a principle of, of Bible study. When you find tension between two verses, that, that divine tension where it seems to be saying one thing here and one thing there, be careful that you do not fall into the trap of camping on one and ignoring its context or the other text. Uh, that's how people uh, end up building a, a, a monument of an idea exclusive to the rest of what the Bible says just to fit our own Bible box. That's how people become sidetracked with such ideas that Jesus uh, somehow uh, wasn't really fully God or, or that Jesus really didn't die for everyone in the world. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. He, he does not argue against Himself. We may struggle and wrestle with the text, but we are to understand it in the context of the entire Bible, not a pet verse or two. So, what is Paul saying? Look at the beginning of the text. Therefore, because of the things that we read just a moment ago that have already happened, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Paul is basically saying that, that you need to keep doing the right thing even if I'm not with you. You know, as kids, all of our graduates, when we're little, it's pretty easy to do the right thing when mom and dad are right there to grab hold of us if we start getting out of line, isn't it? Of course it is. Uh, but the challenge becomes doing the right thing when they're not there. Uh, doing the right thing when nobody else really is looking at us. Uh, when the school teacher doesn't have her or his eyes fixed on us in class as we're sitting in the back of the room thinking they can't see us. 
or our coaches uh, as though they don't have their eyes on us. Uh, We need to remember, Paul is saying, you ought to keep on obeying God even though I'm not here to remind you to stay on the right path. In other words, as a Christian, you ought to stand for yourself, as yourself, by yourself in living for Jesus and believing in Him, in obeying God and standing on His Word, Uh, not because uh, of our parents or our student pastor or another authority figure in our lives is telling us to do this. It is because we choose to do this, and we can do nothing less because we are, if we're saved, disciples, followers of Jesus. Uh, I remember when I would be in the youth, sitting with the youth group at First Baptist Church when I finally got into uh, middle school, and I moved up to sit with them. I was no longer on the third row down front with dad and my little sister, Julie. Mom would sing in the choir, and yet I would sometimes get the sickest of feelings when I would be having fun uh, doing something other than listening to the sermon by Dr. Pleitz, and my mother would, I would feel this burning hole. It was like a laser beam right between my eyes, and I would look down, and there would be mom staring straight to me, busted. I know I'm in trouble. It's too late to go back. Oh, Lord, I need your mercy. Have you ever been there? That is not how God wants us to obey Him as mature Christians. You know, this is an important component for all of our high school graduates today as they prepare to go on to college or military service or enter the professional workforce. If you're a Christian, that living in obedience to God in your life is just as important as when you were living at home, perhaps even more so. Uh, Many of you going to secular schools will be faced by professors who will think it is their calling in life to discourage you and separate you from your Christian faith, and they will have plenty of your classmates to help them in that goal. First of all, realize that your faith is not legend or fantasy or myth, that your faith is is Christianity, not churchianity, that, that remember that no matter how smart or winsome or cute the questions and digs that the professor has practiced countless times before countless other freshmen or older classmen, remember they are minuscule in comparison to the giants of the faith like St. Augustine, John Knox, Polycarp, Ignatius, the Apostle Paul, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and on and on we could go. Why take the word of a professor who's not even a believer as to being the authority figure as to convince you that Christianity is untrue? Number two, you don't have to go very far into apologetics to understand that as long as the tomb of Jesus Christ is unoccupied, case closed. No discussion. No debate. Uh, You can compare Christianity to any other world religion, and none of them nor all of them put together make the claim that Christianity does and is yet to be proven untrue, that Jesus on the third day bodily rose from the dead. As one freshman student said, I'm following the one who rose up from the dead and ain't dead anymore. See, these are important things to hold on to. Now, we're back to the phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, Did Paul say work for? Did Paul say work up? Did Paul say work into? No, Paul said work out. You and I are not trying to achieve our salvation or hold on to our salvation, but we're seeking to demonstrate our salvation, to display it, to continue on living out, as it were, our salvation. The word work in the Greek means to carry out something to its reasonable conclusion. That's what it means. In other words, now you've been saved. Now that you've been born again, be sure you live saved. 
Be sure you live like you are a new person in Christ. And our motivation for doing so is found in the next section of verse 12. Paul says, with fear and trembling. Paul isn't talking about a terrified life. Paul is talking about rather to live out your faith in personal reverence to God. You want to bring honor to Him. Dr. Jimmy Draper writes, if we love someone, then we are not afraid of what they might do to us, but we are afraid of what we might do to them. We're not to be afraid of what God might do to us, but we should be afraid that we may bring shame and embarrassment to Him. And then notice in verse 13, Paul goes on to say, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Now, the Amplified Bible puts it this way, for it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you both to will and to work, that is strengthening, energizing, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for His good pleasure. Whose responsibility is it then for those of us who are Christians to work out our own salvation, as Paul said? Is it God's? Is it ours? And the answer is yes. It is both of us. God gave you a free will. Choose to use it in displaying and working out your salvation in this life. God has promised to not only give to you through the empowerment of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit the ability to do it, but even to help foster the desire in your heart to do it. That little thought I should obey Jesus here. I should do what the Bible says there in my life. That's not just you. That's not just the memory of the voices of your Christian parents or youth pastor or your pastor echoing in your mind and heart. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you in that moment. When Paul uses the word will, then he is describing our commitment He's describing our motivation, our feeling, as it were, to live our lives for Christ and to obey Him in all that we say and do. We live saved because we have been saved, because we have been saved, because we are being saved. That's what the word sanctification means in the Christian life. It is the working out of our salvation. We have been saved in the past. We continue to live saved and are being saved in the present, and we are looking forward to being saved forever, glorified with the Father in the presence of the Son there in heaven someday. That's sanctification. A college freshman found themselves in a hostile environment, which is not unusual these days on America's college campuses. Parents, you need to be aware of that, paying thousands of dollars and going in debt and hoping that your child does not become a casualty in their faith on that hostile environment. We need to be sure we stay in touch. We stay connected. We stay prayerful. We stay in communication with them, praying for them always. You do know, by the way, that graduation does not give you a time where you can coast when it comes to your faith. No, in many ways, the real work is just beginning. Notice and remember that a lot of people are experts when it comes to writing books about how to raise kids when they're little, but they are silent once they graduate from high school, as everybody knows. In any case, this college freshman found themselves before a hostile atheistic professor, and and they were in a class where it seemed that that even if there were other Christians, they were afraid to speak up when they saw uh, that this person was being made fun of and was being derided and even mocked, pressured to capitulate and, and to give in and to surrender up what they said they believed. And after class, some of the classmates gathered around an upperclassman, and they thought they would carry on the conversation from what the professor had started. And one of them said to this freshman, are you afraid that you're just going to hurt all those people back at church or your parents if you do this thing? And the freshman said, I said, no. Uh, no, I'm not af- being afraid of being hurt by them. I'm being afraid of hurting my Lord. Remember, 
we are to work out our salvation. Number two, you've got a new attitude. A new attitude. Look at verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Did you hear what Paul said? Paul said literally, do all things. Really? Can we revise that? Would anybody like to revise this verse and say, do some things? Wouldn't it be easier if we just did some things without grumbling? I mean, isn't grumbling and complaining, isn't that written in our, our right to grumble in the Declaration of Independence or something like that? Doesn't it say that? Oh, one pastor put it this way, Paul doesn't allow us to pick and choose what we will do with a happy, contented heart. Uh, does this mean when you're at work? Yes. Uh, does this mean when you're at school? Yes. Does this mean when you're at home? Yes. And does this mean when you're at church? Yes. Some of us have already blown it. We are to do all things without grumbling. We need to realize that the problem of grumbling is a lot bigger than simply you and I expressing our opinion or preference about something. Uh, it, it has theological implications because it's the assertion of self-centeredness, that we are saying that because we're not getting what we think we deserve, or we're not being allowed to do what we want to have done, uh, then somehow that we have the right to grumble and complain because we have elevated ourselves to a point where the, we are beco have become our own ultimate authority, and, and therefore we don't like something because we know better. And when we grumble, what we're really saying is we're not at fault. When we grumble, what we're saying is, I'm excused from what God says right here through Paul in Philippians 2. Adam, after all, he started it, didn't he? After he had sinned, God came to him, and what did he do? He grumbled against his wife. He said, it's not my fault, it's this woman that you gave to me. And so we've been grumbling at each other ever since. There's something else about grumbling that isn't good, and that is it's contagious. Grumbling is always contagious in the local church. The word complaining or grumbling that Paul uses gives us a picture of words that cannot quite be distinguished. It's like sound, but you can't pick out exactly what's being said. There's noise there, but it's indistinguishable unless you're right there connected. But you hear it, you know it's there. Uh, the word would be murmuring. Uh, Mary will sometimes say, you, well, I can't understand what you're saying when you're not looking at me and you're talking. It sounds like you are mumbling. Honey, I promise I'm not grumbling when you think I'm mumbling, okay? Before witnesses here, I just want to be sure. That's not the case most of the time. So anyway, the complaining that is being confronted by Paul is the kind that is between Christians. He's not talking about the world. That's a give me. That's how it is outside of the church. What he's saying about is this is not how it should be inside of the church. He's describing Christians complaining and grumbling against each other. Imagine that, a Baptist church right here in the book of Philippians. And then Paul uses the word disputing are arguing, which is a warning that if you don't stop your grumbling, then others will join in, and that doesn't mean they'll always be on your side when they do. And so what happens is you have the antithesis of what the Bible says the local church should be like, unified and in harmony as, as the blood-bought body and bride of Christ, believers, that assembly, that ecclesia coming together in one, being in one accord. And, and the dangerous thing about this kind of speech is that our grumbling opens the door for not only others to join in with us and promoting dissension and arguing within the very fellowship and the body and bride of Christ, but it tears down our witness and people in the world say, I've got enough of that already. Why do I want to give up my Sunday morning and get more of that stuff? Who would? Uh, the writer of Proverbs wrote in Proverbs 6.16, these six doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, King James Version. 
And the last thing he lists is this, he that soweth discord among brethren. What is it that God hates? Seven things. What's the seventh thing? Those who sow discord among brethren. So be very careful before you argue your justification that you have the right to grumble about something because of your Scotch-Irish corpuscles or your red hair or that's your personality or that's just the way you are. The Bible says, be different. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. All means all. That's right. When God saved you, He did a lot of things for you. He made you a new person, a new creation. He gave you uh, the ability to have the mind of Christ. Your body became a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus began preparing a place for us in heaven, all of us who are saved and believe in Him and belong to Him. He gave us a commission to take His gospel into all the world. He's given us an opportunity in this life to do good works. Uh, to earn rewards in heaven, not salvation, but rewards for good works. God made you into something you've never been before. Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creation, a new creature. All things are passed away, and all things have been made new. And along with you, all of these other things that God has done for you, He gave you a new attitude, and I'm not talking about the song. I heard John Maxwell say once, our problem is that we have upward hopes but downward habits, mm. a good word. Do you have any negative downward habits you need to turn over to the Lord? What about how you handle the challenge of change or disappointment or frustration? Uh, you know, we can't escape change. Oftentimes, we need to change. Sometimes, we are forced to change. But the change itself is most of the time, not the biggest thing. It is how we handle that change that matters. It gives us the opportunity to work out our salvation, to demonstrate our faith, to maintain our fellowship. The wonder of our church family and the diversity is also the harmony and the unity of this blood-bought body and bride of Christ called First Roanoke. We are one church family, but it requires attention. It requires protection that God has brought together. That's why Paul said in verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Why is it that we should live this way with a new attitude? Because when we do, then we show ourselves to be the children of God as we should. The words blameless and innocent that Paul uses, that means pure. It's like wine that has not been watered down. It's pure. It's not weak. Uh, Paul is saying, don't water down your testimony. Don't water down your witness. Don't water down your fellowship. Don't water down your testimony as lights to the gospel of Jesus Christ because you choose to act with the old attitude of the old person you were before God saved you. And then Paul reminds them that they were living in a crooked and twisted generation. Look at the word, crooked and twisted generation. That means they were right in the middle of the world that was lost, a world that was uh, confused, a world that was dark, and yet Paul is saying you should live your life as a blameless Christian. You shouldn't give the world the reason to criticize you except if it's in doing good. By the way, the word for crooked comes from the Greek word scolios. Does that sound familiar? We get our medical word scoliosis, a a condition, as you know, of the curvature of the spine. In, In the case that Paul is using the word, it means to be morally bent or twisted. Uh, He was describing his time, but he might as well have been describing our time. Our world today is twisted. It is confused. It is perverse. That's what the word twisted means. It means that you've hung a plumb line, God has, to show us the straight path, and we have wandered off that path, and we are intentionally building it 
our way, doing our thing. We've walked away from the moral virtue and God's standard of what is right and good and true, and we've embraced that which is ugly and false and wicked. And then we are to hold on to God's Word, number three. Verse 16, holding fast to the Word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Philippians 2, 16. Too many times we let go of the very thing we should hold on to the most, God's Word. We should hold on to it in our hearts. We should hold on to it in our minds. We should hold on to it in our lives and in our words and in our actions. The Bible says a, God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The world is growing in its spiritual darkness every day. How can we hope to be the light that God has saved us and called us to be if we ignore His Word. The Greek word for holding fast in verse 16 that Paul uses means to hold tight and also to hold forth. What a picture of the gospel. We're to hold on to it tight, and we're to give it away every chance we get. We're to hold on to it and not let it go, and we're to give it away at every opportunity God presents. Offer it to others so that they too can believe as you have believed when you were saved. Do you remember when Peter was talking to the Lord Jesus, answering his question, really, after Christ had said some very hard things to the crowd, and the crowd turned away, and so many turned away, you can almost hear the surprise in our Lord's voice as He turns to the twelve disciples, and He says, are you two going to leave me? And Peter replies in John 6, verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, they had followed, they had heard, they had listened, they had believed that when Jesus taught them this promise, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. They held on to the light to the Word of life, to the Word of light. The gospel is the light of life and the Word of life. Hold on to the Word of life and offer it to as many people as you can. That is what God is asking us to do. And why do we do it? Because of the phrase, the day of Christ. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, what is he talking about the day of Christ? He's reminding them of of this simple fact. He's reminding them that Jesus is coming. He is reminding them that they are going to see their Savior face to face. He is reminding them that one day this life will be over. Time will be up. And that which we had the opportunity to do will be forever past because now we'll be in heaven and what's done is done and there we will be.